Bruchem Aboyim. Welcome to our home. Um, this week, the topic on uh, my thoughts will be uh, something uh, very apropos because we're in the middle of it, is counting the Omer. So this week on my thoughts, I would like to discuss the Torah commandment to count what we call the Svira to Omer, the counting of the Omer period. Wikipedia describes it as a ritual in Judaism. Uh, it consists of a verbal counting of each of the 49 days between the holidays of Passover and Shavuot. This period of 49 days is known as the Omer period, or simply referred to as the Omer or the Sphira. Again, Sphira means to count. The count has its origin in the third book of the Torah, Leviticus, and the portion of Amor, where the Torah commands us to count both seven weeks and 49 days. Now, in addition, the Torah commands that the nation bring an Omer offering uh, in the temple in Jerusalem. The commandment is viewed again in the fifth book of the Torah, in Deuteronomy, in the portion of Re'e. The obligation to count the Omer in the post-temple destruction era uh, is a matter of dispute among the rabbis. Since we no longer have a temple, in reality there's no way for us to bring temple offerings which are connected with the Omer count. That being the case, the Rambam, Maimonides, suggest that the counting of the Omer is still a Torahic obligation even today. However, most other rabbinic authorities assume that though we still count, it is only a rabbinic command in post-temple times. So let me begin, begin this discussion with a little history as to why we count the Omer. God had told Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father, at the Brit Ben Hapsar, at the covenant between the parts, that his descendants would be enslaved for 400 years. However, God was compelled to redeem the children of Israel from their servitude in Egypt earlier than he had originally planned, since they had fallen to the 49th level of impurity. Had they had fallen one more level, they would have entered into the abyss, and then they would have been lost forever. So God Almighty had no other alternative but to redeem them 190 years earlier, only after only 210 years, so, I, so to speak, premature birth of sorts. Now, he redeemed them based on the merit of their future acceptance of the Torah on Mount Sinai, an event which was scheduled to occur 50 days after they left Egypt. Now, in order for the nation to be eligible to accept the Torah, the nation needed to reach the 49th level of purity. Then they would merit to receive the Torah directly from God Almighty on the mountain. Uh, there was, of course, one huge problem. When they left Egypt, as I mentioned, they were on the 49th level of impurity. And then they needed to reach the 49th level of purity. So God had them count 49 days of the Omer. It was his hope that, that with each day of counting, that they would elevate their souls higher and higher so that they would reach the 49th level of purity on the holiday of Shavuot and merit to receive the Torah. If you think about it logically, again, there's a problem. If they are on the 49th level of impurity and they needed to reach the 49th level of purity, they should have counted 98 days, not 49. They should have begun their count with the 49th level of impurity and then counted up until zero. After that, they should have begun a new count from the first level of purity until they reached the 49th level. And then they would have been ready to receive the Torah. So, so the question that we have to ask is, why then did they only count 49 days? Well, the answer can best be understood through an analogy. Uh, let's say that you go to a yard sale and you buy a black candelabra, you pay only 15 bucks for it. When you come home, you decide to take the dross, the black covering, off of the candelabra. And lo and behold, huh, it shines. Your candelabra was silver. But did you make it shine? The answer is no. You just remove the dross, and then silver just naturally shines. So too with the Jew. By a Jew's very nature, there exists within them a spark of divinity, what we refer to as a pintle yid, a holy godly soul. 
This cell is pristine. It always shines. However, many times we cover it up with transgressions that we perform daily. In order for a Jew to shine, they do not have to turn over a new leaf. No, they just have to do what we call teshuva, repent. Now, the Hebrew word teshuva is made up of two words. Toshuv, which translates to mean to return back, and hey, to God, because the hey is an allusion to the Hebrew letter, hey, to God Almighty. Based on this fact, all that a Jew has to accomplish is to remove the dross that covers their godly soul, and then they will automatically shine. This is the reason that we count only 49 days of the Omer and not 98. It is not a ritual that necessitates the participation of a Jewish court or a quorum, a minion of 10 men. Each person has the ability and responsibility to elevate themselves personally. Those individuals who avail themselves of this opportunity to elevate their character traits during this period of time will reap great spiritual benefits. However, those who allow these days to pass without giving any thought to what these days represent will not be able to truly appreciate what spiritual connection there exists within the holidays of Passover and Shavuot. Now the sphere of period begins with the Omer offering, which consisted of barley. During this time in history, barley was considered to be animal fodder. This is an allusion to the fact that at the time of the exodus from Egypt, our ancestors were on the spiritual level of animals. They then spent the next 49 days elevating themselves to the level of man. That being the case, on Shuo, 50 days later, their offering was then wheat, people food. So the deeper meaning of the counting of the Omer is for us to attempt to elevate ourselves from the level of animal and to hopefully reach the level of human. It's interesting, Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri states at the end of chapter 2 in the Tractate of Edios that the term of punishment for the weak, wicked in purgatory is only from Passover through Shavuot. Since beginning from the time of the exodus from Egypt, this period has been designated as a time for removing the stains from our souls and purifying them from their contamination, both in this world and in the next. Now the Torah commands us to count not only days, but also weeks, as it states, and you shall count for yourself seven Shabbosos. The Torah refers to these weeks as Shabbos, to teach us that Shabbos is the primary day of the week, and from it, all the other days of the week receive its sustenance. You know, as we know, the number seven alludes to the seven days of creation, each week of the Svira. We have the ability to recreate our own personal world. By doing so, we can, in some way, help to bring the whole world in general closer to the state of purity that God Almighty so desires for his world. Now, the Zohar states that God wanted to marry the children of Israel on the holiday of Shavuot. However, there was a problem. You see, they were in the state of nida, menstruation, a spiritual impurity. The nation as a whole needed to purify themselves for seven weeks. Now, this is in contrast to the seven days needed for a woman to be purified from her menstrual cycle. The reason why they needed to observe seven weeks in contrast to the seven days was because of the extraordinary amount of impurity that they had accumulated during their 210 years in Egypt. Now these seven weeks correspond to the seven emotional traits that God Almighty has taken upon himself when he created this world, ex nihilo, something from nothing. The seven traits are chesed, kindness, gvura, severity or discipline, tiferet, beauty or truth, netzach, eternity, hod, splendor, and yesod, foundation. Now, all of these six traits are masculine. The last trait is malchut, kingship, which is the only feminine trait. Each one of the seven weeks that we count represent one of these seven traits. That is in addition to the fact that each day 
is a combination of two of these traits. For example, the first day is referred to as chesed sheva chesed, kindness of kindness. The second day is, is called gevura sheva chesed, severity of kindness, and so on. So during this period of the year, we focus on trying to elevate ourselves each and every day, moving from one level to the next. We do this as one continuous effort with the intent of reaching the spiritual height of the 49th level, which was necessary to once again receive the Torah from God Almighty himself, as did the children of Israel when they received the Torah on Mount Sinai. Now these seven weeks correspond to the seven Ushbizin, the seven guests that visit us in our sukkah on each day of the holiday of Sukkot. As Elio Kito writes in his book of Heritage, he states that every week is an allusion to one of these seven illustrious personalities, one of whom leads the other assembled guests into our sukkah each night of the holiday. The first week alludes to Avram Avinu, Abraham our father, who personifies the attribute of chesed, loving kindness, through his selfless love and devotion to all people, the whole world was brought closer to God Almighty. The second week alludes to Yitzchak of Vino, Isaac, our father, who personifies the attribute of Gvura, strength of character, discipline. Through him, the whole world learned to be in awe of God, our father in heaven. The third week alludes to Yaakov of Vino, Jacob, our father, who personifies the attribute of Tiferet, beauty. As the Torah states that Yaakov was an ish tam, a perfect individual. He was able to incorporate the attributes of both his father and his grandfather, blending them together into one cohesive unit of truth and of beauty. The fourth week alludes to Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, who personifies the attribute of Netzach, eternity, which is Torah. Moshe gave up his life for the Torah and was thereby able to ensure its eternity and the eternity of the nation of Israel for all generations. The fifth week alludes to Aaron HaKohen, Aaron the priest, who personifies the attribute of hod, splendor. He brought humility, gratitude, and peace into the world, as stated by Hillel in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, that Aaron was an Oev Shalom and a Rodev Shalom, a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace. He loved all of mankind and brought them closer to the Torah. The sixth week alludes to Yosef HaTzadik, Joseph the Righteous One, who personifies the virtue which lies at the foundation of our existence in the exile. He was the first Jew to live and bring up his children in a totally immoral society. Nonetheless, he was still successful at instilling within, instilling within them deep and true Torah values. Even today, we still bless our sons on Friday night with the blessing, Yusimcha Elohim Kephraim Uke Menashe. May God bless you to be like Ephraim and Menashe. Two young men who were brought up in the most licentious and immoral country of the time. Their father was the second most powerful man in the world, and yet they were able to exceed their potential and merit to become one of the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, the Gematria, the numerical value of the names, Ephraim and Menashe, are 732, a number higher, one number higher than the gematria of the numerical value of the names Ruvain and Shimon, 731. The seventh week alludes to Dovna Melech, King David, who personifies the attribute of kingship, the only one of the seven emotional traits that is feminine. The Zohar states that David was born with no years of his own. He was to have died at childbirth. However, Adam Arisham, first man, bequeathed to him 70 years of his life as a gift. Dabra Malik lived his whole life based on humility, self-sacrifice, and teshuvah. He taught the world to sing songs of praise to God, the King of the world, under any circumstance, through his writing of the five books of Psalms, Tehillim. Now, each of these midot, personality traits, are closely interwined in all are interdependent, none exist in isolation. Kindness, 
without strength of character becomes soft-heartedness. Glory without kindness leads to sin. None of these qualities are complete unless kindness is an integral part of their makeup. You know, the Hassam Sofer brings an interesting point. When a person brings to a totus sacrifice, which a sacrifice which is brought by an individual who had experienced a miraculous salvation from God Almighty, in addition to the animal that was brought, the person would also offer a mincha, a meal offering, which consisted of fine flour and oil. Altogether, the individual would bring 40 loaves of bread, now 30 which were matzah and 10 that were chametz. Now the 10 loaves of chametz were equal in weight to the 30 loaves of matzah. The chametz alludes to one's body and the matzah alludes to one's soul. Normally, when one would offer a toe to sacrifice, they would bring all 40 loaves together at the same time. However, when the children of Israel left Egypt, they had not yet reached a level, of, a level spiritually high enough to bring both the chametz and the matzah together. So on the night of Passover, when they were freed, when they freed all the spiritual sparks that were sequestered in Egypt, then they partook of the spiritual part of the totus sacrifice, symbolized by the matzah. It was only on the holiday of Shavuot, when they reached the level of Kedusha Taguf, sanctification of the body, that they were able to bring Shnei Lechem, the two loaves of chametz, which represent the more material aspects of the body. However, this raises a question. Why do we all eat matzah on Passover? Yet on Shavuos, it is only the Kohanim, the priest, that ate the Shnei Lechem, the two loaves of chametz. Now, the answer may well be that every Jew, every Jew has within themselves a lofty, godly soul, which allows them to partake of matzah. We witnessed that when the whole nation stood at the foot of Mount Sinai, for a special moment in time, they were able to reach the level of Kedushat Taguf, the sanctification of the body. However, that level of spirituality was only a temporary situation. It was, it was unrealistic to believe that it was a state of holiness that they, as a nation or as individuals, could maintain. Only those Sadikim Gemurim, the truly righteous individuals that are symbolized by the Kohanim, that possibly would be able to retain that level of sanctity. That being the case, it was only they and not the people that partook of the Shnei Lechem, the two loaves of Chometz, that were brought in the temple on the holiday of Shavuot. You know, next week, we will celebrate Lagba Omer. Lagba Omer, which translates to mean the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer. It is a day which represents the concept of Hod Shavuot Hod, the trait of splendor of splendor. This trait is represented by Aaron HaKohen, the paradigm of love and humility. Now, the Hebrew word Hod is taken from the Hebrew word Hodah, which means thank you. The essence of Judaism is saying thank you. Thank you to God Almighty and saying thank you to man. However, with all of our many blessings, we many times find it difficult to realize just how blessed we really are. We have a tendency to become complacent and to take our daily blessings for granted. We perceive our good fortune many times as the norm. The second temple was destroyed because of the sin of sinat china, baseless hatred. It is our hope and prayer that we can follow the example of Arna Cohen and focus all of our efforts on the concept of avas china, baseless love. The emergence of the Jewish nation can also be compared to the three stages of the birth of a child into this world. The embryo developing in the womb of its mother is a connection to the nation of Israel being sequestered in Egypt. The actual birth is a connection to the birth of the nation at the giving of the Torah in Mount Sinai. And then the growth of the child is a connection to the nation as they entered into the land of Canaan. You know, so too the history of the world is divided into three stages. The first 2,000 years is before the giving of the Torah, which are referred to as the years of Tohu, void. The second 2,000 years after the giving of the Torah are viewed as a tikkun ha'olam, 
a correction of the world. And then the last third, 2,000 years, with the advent of the coming of the Messiah, may he come quickly and in our time. This last 2,000 year period teaching us that we never give up. It is never, never too late. Tonight we will count the 28th day of the Omer. Next week, we will be ushering a special day of Lagba Omer the 33rd day of the counting of the Omer. You know, the Marsha commenting on the Talmud in Moe Cotton states that Lagba Omer marks the beginning of the final third stage of the days of the Omer. Now, even though more than half of the Omer has already passed, and we may not yet have availed ourselves of the opportunities for growth that the counting of the Sphera offers, however, there is still time for us to explore the challenge that each of the remaining days of the Omer presents. We do so in the hope that we will once again be able to stand before God Almighty on the night of Shavuot and receive his Torah anew. You know, we learned this lesson from Rabbi Akiva and his 24,000 students, all of whom died during this period of the Sphira. It is stated that all these students died up until the 33rd day of the Omer. This is one of the reasons given for the great celebration of the day. After experiencing this tragedy, having to witness the death of all of his illustrious students, what did Rabbi Akiva do? Did he give up? No. He started all over again and this time with only five students. These five students would become the greatest leaders of the generation and lights unto the whole world. Among them was Rabbi Meir, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechoi is also known by the Archimand Rashbi, who died on the day of Lagba Omer. His body is buried in the city of Moron in Israel. Up until this very day, there are still hundreds of thousands of people that descend upon the city of Moron to celebrate his day of passing as he had requested. Large bonfires can be seen burning throughout the length and breadth of the whole land of Israel, not just in Moron. The Rashbi is credited with being the author of the Zohar, the book upon which all of Kabbalah and Hasidus are based. Now the count of the Omer is hopefully a time when we can all take an honor